Hello, and welcome to Season 4, Episode 8 of the ESG Experience, the podcast about all things ESG and beyond. Whether you're an ESG expert or just dipping your toes into the ESG universe, this podcast is for you. Together, we'll navigate the alphabet soup of ESG, share strategies, and discuss industry news and trends. I'm Healy Lev, SVP of ESG Operations at Conservis. Hi, Healy, and I'm Ryan Nelson, the SVP and General Manager of ESG at Conservis. Today, we are lucky enough to be joined by Jeff Senny, who is the founder and CEO of Sandbar Solutions, a consultancy that supports CEOs, C-suites, boards, investors, and their teams, activating business strategies aligned to purpose and underpinned by ESG, corporate responsibility, sustainability, and DE&I. Jeff serves as a trusted advisor, coach, partner, retained chief sustainability officer in the areas of strategy and goal setting, program design, execution and management, impact measurement, communications, and reporting to established organizations and ones that are new to the space. In this episode, we'll be exploring corporate responsibility teams and boardrooms amidst the backlash surrounding ESG initiatives. Ooh, it sounds a juicy. This is a juicy one. We'll discuss the strategies for navigating the tumultuous landscape, highlighting what actions to take, what pitfalls to avoid, how to uh, manage the Thanksgiving table. should add that in because um, this, the debates over ESG and other such political items have split apart families. Um, and Jeff will help us examine the imperative to reconsider and redefine the roles of government, civil society, and individuals in propelling ESG agendas within companies. All right, Jeff, we are so happy to have you here today live from Buenos Aires. Bienvenidos yeah, on Oyster Podcast. Yeah, thank you very much. Glad to be here. Yeah, welcome. Um, Healy, he's in Phoenix today, but you did touch on the adventure of his world world travels and where he lives that we'll get into. That's ah, right. Okay. Phoenix. And uh, welcome from Phoenix. I don't know how you say welcome in um, Arizonian. <laughs> yeah. It might be like, welcome like the plainest possible way of saying welcome. You know? did you hear oh sorry this is a funny aside did you hear uh, this is old news but the perfect accent least offensive accent or way to speak for newscasters okay they said like hey you want to be a newscaster you want to offend no one i always heard it was st louis i believe that i i would have guessed it was was the midwest yeah, but it can't be like the Chicago or the Wisconsin. That's too much, right? Yeah. It's got to be a little bit farther down and like that. I've got, I've got the Wisconsin. Mm, yeah. yeah. And I got yeah. the Chicago. <laughs> you I do. I call on it all the time. I do. You do have some of the Chicago. Yeah. Well, good. Yeah, great to have you from wherever you are. And Jeff, obviously, it doesn't matter too much in this virtual world. So um, I want to cover one very important thing about the backlash and the chaos i don't want to spend all our time on that and i'll get into why in a minute but i want to cover that but first more importantly uh sandbar solutions i tried to find out why you call it sandbar i have a few theories but i couldn't find where you just set it plain as day uh, but from some of the images and the concepts I, I maybe got there but do you want to tell us um a little bit about sandbar and why it's called sandbar sure sure well, I left, I was at PwC for 11 years or so. I left as the responsible business leader and we were going through a reorg at a time when my wife, who works for the Inter-American Development Bank, um, we'd been in Washington for about 15 years. And in her world, the, the world of development, you really ha need to do these rotations into the developing world. And that's where we met, actually. She's Brazilian, but we met when I was working in Chile and she was. And so she found a, a role in Buenos Aires. She does uh, climate finance uh, for the bank. And Argentina is just as it is uh, for the IMF, it's the largest uh, recipient of aid from the IDB. And they did about, I think, 700 million in climate finance last year investment. And uh, it was a really exciting opportunity and we wanted our 11 year old son to have an international experience and so i left pwc hung out my shingle and i'm well known for loving kite surfing um my favorite thing to do with kite surfing is jump in the water and go 40 miles downwind to a bed and breakfast and then the next day do the same thing and mm -hmm. and uh explore the i usually do this in brazil uh explore the coast of brazil so i've done five six hundred mile trips kind of like long distance um backpacking and so the sandbar is 
<clears throat> kind of part of my personal kite surfing uh, brand. But I also think of it, the sandbar, as one of nature's solutions, like mangrove swamps of protecting coastlines, protecting communities. And I like to think of ESG through that lens as well, as it's a it's a protection mechanism um, that you know new land can grow from you know new opportunities can sprout from and risks can be avoided so I, I like the natural kind of resonance of sandbars and and how they serve ecosystems and how ESG or corporate responsibility does the same. Yeah, very cool. Thanks for sharing that story. The other thing I was thinking because I saw some like uh, rough looking. Uh, waves and stuff on some air images and i was thinking of the sandbar as like a safe place sometimes in a in a wild area like right. out of nowhere there's like the safe place you can stand my experience of sandbars is not um is it called kite surfing yeah kite surfing like yours mine's like finding a sandbar where so you can pull up your pontoon boat and you know hang out and then stand mm -hmm. on it and drink a beer or something like yeah, that no, so, that's good too <laughs> yeah it, it has been good uh, doing that in inland lakes uh, on sandbars around uh, the, the upper Midwest. Yes, but a whole, a whole different journey. So let's talk about this backlash. Um, and I kind of hinted I don't want to talk about it too much, but we can if it's important. I haven't found it to be important in the way that businesses are still doing what they need to do, but you're more engaged in this than I am. So how does this ESG backlash, is it creating chaos and fear in corporate responsibility teams and boardrooms? Are they shutting things down in mass? You know, what do we need to know about how to, I mean, it comes up all the time. Like, well, how are you doing this? Is your business in big trouble now? Like, um, because it's something important to us. So what do you, what is your experience with the backlash? Yeah, I think, you know, the wider question, if we, if we back up from ESG and DEI backlash is, how to do business in the era of hyper partisanship and culture wars and that has a national component between <clears throat> the democrats and republicans but that also has an international component between the west or at least the u.s narrative and the chinese or russian narrative and <clears throat> you know the the rise of disinformation or misinformation and how we deal with that and I think companies are now working in environments that don't have quite the same rule set that they did five or 10 or 15 years ago. And we're all adjusting to that. I think that the ESG backlash has been much ado about nothing. Um, although, and and much to the much the same for the DEI backlash. Although I think the DEI backlash has probably got some more teeth because there's more litigious nature to quotas that companies were setting or and whether mm -hmm. they called them that or not. Right. I mean, I think of DEI efforts that had quotas as affirmative action. And I don't think of that as a bad thing. I, I think the United States put affirmative action in place for a good reason. Um, and whether it was perfectly managed in the 70s, you know, or not, we by calling it affirmative action in my mind that helps us learn the lessons of where affirmative action was successful and where it wasn't and contextualizing that i think we're seeing that in the supreme court rulings and how there's pushback against the university and how companies are kind of running scared i think the esg backlash um was slightly different because esg was really created i was at the united nations global compact when the who cares wins report in 2004 was published and it was essentially a reframing of the corporate responsibility or what we called corporate citizenship at the at the compact <clears throat> to say what's the investor's lens on this why is this relevant to investors so the entire concept of esg is, is that if it doesn't drive business value, we're not saying you shouldn't do it. We're saying we don't really care about it because we're the investors. And, you know, so we're looking at how these investments are driving business value, which it's hard to see how that is, you know, how that's controversial. Um, and so I think most companies are staying the course. They're maybe green hushing a little bit now. They're, they're being a little less um, vocal in their right. But I think both DEI and ESG backlash emerged 
there there is some good that comes out of this, which is, is you know, the number of corporate boards that signed off on net zero commitments without understanding anything about net zero, it's got to be in the 90 percent range. Mm -hmm. like it's got. And and I think much the same is true of DEI. I think many companies rushed headlong into this in this kind of Pollyannish, overly optimistic view of we're going to do this and it's not really going to cost us anything and it's going to be you know we're going with the flow we're going to it's it's all going to work out not realizing just what they were getting into and i think there were many csr or cr teams who essentially said we're going to paint the company into a corner and then you know once we've got them in the back back into the corner they're going to figure it out and i just think that's bad strategy mm -hmm. i i think you got to have the conversations up front you got to you know, you've got to inform your board and your C-suite of just what this is and that this is about changing business models, which is going to put up a fight. And sure, there's low hanging fruit and things you can do. But um, I do think that ESG backlash and DEI backlash in some ways shown a, you know, a spotlight on, you know, poor strategy um, or execution practices within CR teams that, should have should be remedied and fixed and i think that's happening now and so you know I, I, but i think you've got to kind of cut through the you know the headlines about it to get to that yeah yeah one thing when it was kind of like the thick of it, it was going on that i would tell my team you know because we're esg minded people we're a mission-based company this is our work and some of the headlines the backlash that were coming out you know this fund is pulling out and these investors are pulling out of this fund and the state of florida this and that was um at least it brought ESG front and center. So as someone who's been in sustainability for my whole career, 20 something years, and those years where no one understood what I did or what it meant, at least now everyone understands it. So it's completely normalized the term. It's brought awareness and education around it. So the fact that it's polarizing is one thing. Sure, you can hate it, love it, everything in between, think that you align politically one way or another, but it's created awareness, which I think is has been meaningful and and you know, even great that it's kind of simmered down. Um, so to that end, I, I think we have a tendency in this country to make things um, political that are not maybe necessarily political by nature, um, like infectious diseases and ESG, other things. So what do you think as an expert in this space is the role of government, big or small, right? Federal government. And that's another thing too, that we kind of, uh, us ESG professionals take um, solace in is that no matter what the federal government is doing in the climate, there's so many grassroots efforts at the, at the municipal level, level at the state level, um, with other groups and NGOs that it's almost irrelevant. I mean, sure, if, if the administration were to wipe the EPA off the face of the planet, that would be challenging. But we've seen resilience even, you know, during different administrations because of the grassroots efforts and these other organizations that are propelling the initiatives forward and uh, ensuring there is regulation in place. So what do you think is the role of government, big or small, um, you know, civil society and even individuals, right? So me as an employee, but also me as a consumer. Um, so there's a lot in that question, but what do you think, what should everybody be doing? What should we do? Yeah, so let, let me back up and, and kind of enter this in a kind of philosophical lens. I, I think there's an American philosopher, well-known, uh, uh, John Rawls, and, and he has a theory called the veil of ignorance. And he, and he says, basically, when you're developing a system or you're, you know, you're grappling with some kind of hard question, try to remove yourself, from the answer in the sense of <clears throat> you're creating a system of government. Don't do that from the perch that you sit on today, but unknowing where you might sit in society um, in that system. So you might be rich, you might be poor, you might be black, you might be white, you might be male, you might be female. So try to create a system and it's essentially, I mean, this is maybe trivializing it, but <clears throat> I have 11 year old boy and, and if, one of his friends come over, comes over and there's one piece of cake. One kid cuts it and the other kid picks which half of the piece they get because that ensures the most fair outcome. Yeah. It's the exact same kind of thinking for me. Like, let's create systems that create fairness and, and create understanding and what have you. And so when I think of the system that we want and we've created in the United States, the government exists for you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I, and then we've created a, a business system, a private enterprise, the private sector to create 
the goods and services that society needs, source of employment, profits for investors, serves a number of different things constrained by the rules and regulations that we put in place. And then civil society, which includes academics and nonprofits and all other things, bring another level of expertise, accountability. They drive a number of different values. And I think that balance has become untethered a little bit. I don't think government is delivering. If we look at life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in the United States versus other developed nations, we don't live longer. You know, we, we're not more free because I would argue th that our freedom isn't well constrained with a sense of shared and collective responsibility, which I think freedom demands, nor are we the happiest people. Um, and so I look at that and I'm like, okay, so the system that we've developed isn't even delivering the outcomes that we we've, we've asked. So let, we need to think about government. And I, and by the way, I think both people that I talk to on both sides of the aisle aisles agree with that statement. You know, <clears throat> now I don't go to the next sentence, which is who's to blame, because I know the answer to that based on <laughs> your political views usually. Um, but and I would argue that <clears throat> you know civil society has its challenges and that the business sector has its challenges. I uh, as I talk to more and more leaders. The Edelman Trust Barometer, for example, the, the trust in business is the highest of any of those sectors. Most corporates are shocked by that because they know that business is actually fairly amoral in most cases. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean, you know, they're, they're fairly ambivalent. They don't think it's their role to make right and wrong dis decisions. And I think that's quite limiting. I think their their role is to make those decisions and to encourage, especially within their lobbying or their decisions on what they do or don't do. I, I'm really interested in the role of business in safeguarding capitalism and democracy. And I look at, you know, what what businesses can do in that space. I think they should continue to support civil society organizations that drive accountability and and help um, solve important problems. I think they should look at the businesses they support, like social media, for example. I I see the benefit of social media. I also see that these are business models that are built on division and grievance, and they get paid by the more clicks they have. And they, the way that they get more clicks is by making us angry at each other. And that is a business model that I don't think other businesses should be supporting with their advertising dollars because I think it's a-democratic. I don't think it brings us together to have a conversation about how to bridge differences in ideology or identity. I think it further entrenches ideology and identity in a way that doesn't lead to compromise um, and solution finding. And businesses should look very carefully about you know, their investments and what they're doing and how, how that affects, because Ian Bremmer, famous political scientist, I heard on a on a recent podcast says, you know, American democracy doesn't exist in its current format in 50 years. And I'm like, holy, <laughs> that's not a small thing to say. <laughs> yeah, I've been hearing that and having conversations with people that we are kind of on at the end of this capitalistic journey. You know, there's some timeline, most likely you can assume that, you know, it's kind of historically that way. Yeah. in a, an economy or a system and maybe we're towards the end i you know i i don't know and then and then behaviors start changing perhaps and that's some of the signifiers but um i appreciate the journey from the philosophical point of view and why all these things even exist so kind of while we're thinking like that uh i pulled a old quote of yours uh that i was going to read I, I thought it quite interesting and i okay. want you to expand on it so you said um, there is no doubt that history is on the side of a more inclusive society. This is from an article just 2022, I, I think, you, you got interviewed. So you said there's no doubt that history is on the side of a more inclusive society. I feel that way too, but I'd love some more supporting context <laughs> to say that. You went on to say, I have little doubt the business world will continue towards openness, acceptance, acknowledgement, and action to ensure systems are fair and equitable, which they are not today so you're optimistic in this case that the natural 
position is to be more inclusive? Is that kind of what you're saying? And where do you get that so that I can use those talking points? Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think that's interesting. So when I talk about social media, for example, you know, the role of business in safeguarding capitalism, democracy, like I don't expect that companies and I have a, a my own webcast and had a discussion with Zeev Klein on this um, really brilliant guy, really interesting. And he he maintains that he thinks we may be heading towards blue companies and red companies. Mm. And I think there's there's some interesting uh you know <laughs> that that's not inconceivable uh, right. i'm not sure that happens with the majority of companies i mean there's plenty of companies that we see that are clearly leaning democratic ben and jerry's and patagonia and you know and there's others like the Koch brothers and i assume chick-fil-a and others that i assume hobby mean, lobby hobby lobby exactly that you you know and that that stake out the other side. So and I think, OK, that's healthy. I think, you know, these platforms can present their values. And, and I think that's great. But I think most companies want to kind of sit in the center. And I don't think they should sit in the center in the sense of like sit on the fence. Um, I think they have to start to take uh, there. There is an HBR uh, article that said, you know, your employees are your cultural auditors or something to that extent. And I think that's right. I think more and more stakeholders are looking at the culture and the ideology and the values of a company. But I think companies get a lot of value from rule of law, institutional kind of firmament, um, this idea of the golden rule or respect for others or listening. These are pretty core values within companies to operate effectively. And in, in internally, and I think if you and inclusion is one of those, um, I think the con the problem with inclusion specifically is that while I am a white male and grew up in fairly humble beginnings, I understand that I had privilege, but it doesn't feel like I did. Right. It didn't feel through the process like I had a hand pushing me at my back or pulling me from the front. But clearly I did compared to somebody with a very different lived experience, a black woman, a black man growing up in a different zip code or what have you. And I think so I understand that uh, intellectually, but I didn't feel that way. And I think there's lots of people who since it didn't feel that way, it's very hard for them to intellectually understand and agree with right. they must have had. And so I think that's really what we're, we're grappling with. And I think companies can continue to help people understand the privilege they have. And it's, off, it's oftentimes not that it's, it's not overt racism, like somebody's keeping others down, it's people are helping people like themselves, which is I think a very natural instinct. Um, and that we split on very obvious divisions like gender or like race or things like that. And that if we can expand our identities to include other pieces, we may connect on, on pieces of our identity that are, are much more inclusive and that benefits business and that benefits society. And I think you'll see more and more of that because ultimately if we continue to discriminate against by, by sexual orientation or by gender or by race and ethnicity, that's essentially limiting your market. Econ you know, basic economics says that this is th this is inefficient. And I think mean, most company executives kind of understand that, if not from a moral standpoint, from an economic standpoint, that that's not a smart thing to do. Yeah, I think it's super sad we resort to it a lot but pretty lame that we have to say fine but economically it'll be better for you like no, i that's wish right. that's, raise yeah. that's the right bar a little that's bit on that but okay fine for now so well, there, can i mean some of them will go above and beyond they don't necessarily need to see a return for every initiative they have but i don't know at the end of the day a for-profit business is a for-profit business but to say that i want to treat those people responsibly and fairly and with respect because I know that they could be part of the market that I might be selling stuff to instead of just saying they deserve it, right. first of all, yeah. then awesome, they're part of a 
market. I mean, you know, like that that's a pretty low low bar, but fair enough. Yeah. I think and, oh, go ahead, Jeff. No, I think that's right. I think in it, I think this gets back to the point of like the roles of these institutions in society. And I think there's been a real perversion of the corporate purpose conversation. We have used corporate purpose to mean, you know, many of the drug drug manufacturers say, you know, drugs for the betterment of humanity or something like that, or, um, you know, whatever organization you name, they probably have a purpose statement that talks about the, you know, their role in some way. And it's usually focused on something. I worked at PwC. It was um, to build trust and solve important problems, which is a nice and malleable enough definition that it can work for a lot of things. But I would argue that in addition to those individual, you know, or, or company led purpose initiatives, we need to really define what the role of business is in society. And you guys just said it there, like, right? You know, these are for profit enterprises. That's part of the permanent part of why they exist. And then wait a second, there's another piece of this, which is they shouldn't be exempted from right and wrong discussions and, you know, making decisions that may or may not be fully baked into the regulatory regime in which they operate or they operate in different regimes. So a global company, for example, is it supposed to have, you know, one set of rules here and another abroad? I, I worked with a company that said, you know, we're we've got X number of thousands employees around the and I don't around the world. And I don't know how they say we don't have, you know, enough variety. Look at all the Asians we employ in Asia. <laughs> just like, uh -huh. like, really? Yeah. <laughs> that, I've heard the term Asian too is just that's on the outs. It's just too okay. like on like there's something I don't want to misquote it or misstate it, but there's something wrong with using the term Asian in the future. It's just too it's like because it constitutes too many countries and regions and races, and it's not actually accurate if you think of all of Asia. But I want to go back to something you said, Jeff, about employees being the cultural auditors, because I do think that that is gonna to start to take shape even more than it has. So maybe this is me um, you know, acting my age and being like, oh, these kids these days. But I will say, I do remember a time when you know, I first started working. So my first um, position out of undergrad was uh, with the Fortune 100 company. And um, we were so grateful still to like have a job. Like, oh, thank you for employing us. Like, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Like, we'll do whatever it takes. Oh, no job too small. Like, love to work late. Like, there was still just this mentality. Now, if you ask for 20 something years, and I feel like we're almost pandering to these employees. Like, they have demands for us. They have demands about how we act, how we pay them, what we do, who we are as a company, who we aren't as a company, the benefits. And they're so vocal about it, where I feel like a lot of times now we're almost, um, we're catering to them in a way where the, you know, some of me wants to be like, who are you? Like, who do you think you are? You've been here for four months and you're demanding this or that, but that's just the way it is now. And I think um, it will depend, right? If the market, if it's an employer or an employee market, and it depends on the space and things like that. But I think the general sentiment or attitude of people being like, thank you so much for employing me. I am so grateful for this job. I plan to be here for 40 years and then retire. Like that's done. They plan to be here. Um, as long as you please them, and then they'll go hop and find the next thing that's better. So I do think, you know, your point about employees being the cultural auditors, they're going to drive some of the change that they want to see um, because they're, they won't tolerate companies, you know, that aren't aligned with their own values and, and what they're, what they want to do. Um, and I like your, in line with that, I like your quote, I see in the notes here, they need to, companies need to Uber themselves before they get Kodak. So Kodak was a um, case study we did too in, at Kellogg and talked about how they're just like, you know what, we do film, we're not doing digital. It, it's not a thing, we do film, that's what we do. And you know, you don't have to explain how, how that went. So I do think companies have to, so, so we can say all these crazy kids and their demands, but I think we do have to kind of adjust how we run a business and what we do and how we address, um, you know, this next up, upcoming generation. I, I think that's right on. And I think I think you're right. And I think a natural <laughs> I loved your, you know, hey, you kids get out of my yard. Um, self I feel like that these days. I do. I do. I think I think we are we are of that age now that we're you know, we're adopting that. And we're we're looking. I think there is some healthy revolution in this mindset that people bring to their jobs today in the sense of 
if we look at if we go back to like why does business exist is is business earning its license to operate in this in this modern context context and i'd say you know sometimes and sometimes not and since we don't have a regulatory regime that can get its arms around this and civil society hasn't proven particularly strong in this businesses are the drivers of this businesses are cascading their values through cdp through net zero goals through dei what have you and so we should ask okay you we've given you something which is limited liability like these companies are given something from society which says hey listen you're gonna do all of this stuff and and i think it's the same is true of civil society by the way all these corporate foundations we're letting them plow their money in there tax-free, which is essentially us subsidizing it because they don't have to pay taxes on it, which means we are, <laughs> you know, the rest of us are. So we are subsidizing whatever their corporate foundation is doing. That has to, that, that right needs to be, that, that I don't think that should be, you know, a, a right, but rather a privilege that has to continue to be earned by these companies and the same in civil society and the same in government. And I think all of these three actors are not quite earning the privileges that we've given them and they need to be rethought. And I think um, as we go through this process, I think the most vocal players are often the ones who feel they have the least to lose. And that's 20 somethings and you know early 30 somethings because they're like, hey, listen, this whole life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, you know, look at my parents and like, this just isn't working out as, as we all had hoped it would. Let's rethink this. Um, and I think that's healthy. I do think that also comes with the hubris of youth, right? You know, um, and, and so there's some yeah. mix up in there. I, there. There's a famous saying, right. I think it's, it's uh, Churchill who said, you know, they 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 use the UK of uh, versions of this, but the, you know his point was, you're um, if you're not a Democrat when you're young, you have no heart, and if you're not a Republican when you're old, you have no brain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Whether you do that or not, I mean, I think there is a little bit of that thinking that as we get older, we become a little more conservative or a little, you know, our mindsets. And when we're young, we should be a little revolutionary. We should be, you know, shouting at the system. Yeah. In, in some context, another thing I appreciate that you said that 10 to 15 years in the future, work is still going to be great some days, tolerable others, and some days it will be terrible. Uh, your boss will still irritate you. The result will bore you. You'll be distracted or disinterested. We're humans and we'll still be humans 10 years from now. Um, so all of those things are real. So what's the actual context of how much, you know, how great can we make the employee experience at work? I, you know, let, let's keep that bar <laughs> reasonable to work very hard at it but it's like work the minute most people's jobs the minute you said hey there's a there's a hundred million in your bank account they're like all right i'm done here then right like still most people's day-to-day -day jobs they would immediately leave if they did not require the money I, a lot of people care much about their job but still if they didn't need it they go i got other things that i could be doing so i think that's the reality. But um, your energy goes towards helping companies understand and act on a true purpose, right? Like with authenticity. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, a quite interesting approach to it. And I think you were kind of getting at it like anyone could say that they have a purpose, but there's some difference if it's if you're living it or not. I think that's right. And defining it large enough. So it's not just this narrow piece. I mean, if we look at how powerful some of these companies are, they could be doing a lot more in not not just carbon emissions and inequality, but in safeguarding and promoting the systems that they derive a tremendous amount of value from. And I think there is an ROI analysis that is missing from our current discussion about, let's say, democracy, you know, democracy is essentially being voted on in 60 countries around the world this year. Capitalism is under threat. If 50 years from now, we don't have the same free market system um, and we don't have, you know, the democratic institutions that we have today, 
business as the most trusted institution will have some explaining to do <laughs> you know like and because and and they will regret not having worked harder to foster those because i do think that there is not only a right and wrong here from my point of view but there is a real business value in these systems um and it worries me that as you know now major western democracies are all putting industrial policies in place so businesses no longer they may think of themselves as non-ideological and sitting on the fence they are being weaponized by governments all around the world so business needs to wake up to that and sometimes be supportive of it i think semiconductors in the us or what have you or you know does it make sense for us to protect our ev market in the united states and block chinese ev mark you know we, we need to have these kinds of conversations and and look at it it's not just about profit you know and loss it's also about the systems that we want to safeguard for the benefit of ourselves and future generations yeah again even if you have to tie it back to the selfish like your own viability like this yes. system if you destroy this system which could be the planet but let's just even say the economic system then you will no longer have a place to thrive like you are as a business or whatever i think that's right i mean a lot of people you know remember that adam smith was an economist and the wealth of nations and they forget that he was also a philosopher and a moralist and you know his moral sentiments work like, and I think this idea that capitalism and, you know, economics is unfettered by any moral or ethical boundaries is just silly. It's just missing the point of what, you know, the father of our modern economic system said, you know, and 200 years of supporting evidence, I would argue. So to the point of, um, you know, the, the work that you do consulting, working with companies to help them either find their purpose or um, market their purpose or align to their purpose, what are just, um, you know, in the few minutes we have examples of like um, epic successes, if you can share, and they could be generic of like companies that are so attached to a beautiful purpose, like, I don't know, Patagonia comes to mind or like companies like that. Or on the flip side, it's always fun to hear about the ones that might come to you that, um, I don't know, they're in some terrible, evil business exploiting animals or something and they're like but find our purpose and we want to use it for marketing do you have any of those kind of tales from the trenches yeah i mean i uh, you know patagonia is is an interesting one because everybody likes to trot it out it's the kind of poster child for sustainability i think we were all likely a little surprised by the fact that it went to become its new you know economic model which is literally owned and operated by the planet now you know the the profits now are plowed back into the environmental program i think that is putting your money yeah, where your mouth is and i think that's awesome that is not a replicable model right like, yeah. so while i love it and i think it you know i proudly wear <clears throat> patagonia stuff and it's it's further you know gelled my support of them it is not something that i think is particularly informative for most companies yeah. I think the much more informative ones are how big companies are navigating these challenges. Um, and I think the the question for me is, it's not the series of litmus tests, you know, okay, we've got, do we, do we have a climate commitment in net zero? And I think SBTI is going to have its challenges um, in, in the near and not too distant uh, future. Um, DEI is now being challenged, but I think, and and now I start to see companies kind of starting to question their support of Twitter. I don't think that question. What what worries me is is that they're they're doing that because you know Musk has made anti-Semitic comments, and I think they should because of that. I also think they should because of a whole host of other reasons that have been plainly evident for some period of time. And people just aren't, uh, you know, it, it's pretty often that they'll say, well, our, you know, our competitors are using it. And yeah. it wasn't you know, a big leap to think that he was about to say something like that. Right. Like, well, yeah, like we've been watching this unravel, you know, uh, the day he bought Twitter, I killed my Twitter account and all three people that followed me on Twitter noticed, <laughs> you know, like no one cared that Jeff Senny jumped off of Twitter. 
but I'm like, this is not hard to see coming. <laughs> like this, you know, and I think there's plenty of good examples like this. I, I would recommend uh, folks watch Ian Bremmer's latest TED talk where he talks about, you know, the people you think are ruling the world and making all these decisions. It's these tech companies. And if they if they come down on, you know, support of X, Y, Z, that helps us great if they don't and they go the other direction we're in trouble and i think a good example of this is that whole um and and google may have took off their you know do no evil thing just because it became a a sideshow in a circus <laughs> it is a little troubling to me that a company you know stated from the beginning do no evil and then had to somehow retract that mm. you know yeah. like i kind of yeah. think look, that should be pretty defensible um <laughs> we should yeah we should yeah be, like Unless you really need to, of course, then maybe you can do it once in a while. Unless you can make money by your evil deeds. <laughs> yeah. There's a there's an interesting book I read 20 years ago called Levi's Children. I think it is no longer in in print, but it was a story about Levi's going into China. And Levi's has had a strong kind of credo or moral code from the very beginning. And they went into China. And this was the era in the 80s when everybody was saying the WTO is going to connect China and Russia to the rest of the world. And when we invite them in the club, they're going to change. This was the I was at the UN right. at this time and, and or, or coming into it. And uh, that has been proven pretty incorrect. Like we invited them in and they kind of stayed doing their own thing. And that has not changed the behavior as we would like. Well, <clears throat> same thing, you know. Levi's went into China and said, we're going to operate according to our values. And at one point they said, we got to leave. They, they, they will not operate according to our values. We need to leave China. And they, and then they realized that actually if they left China, they would no longer be in business within X number of years because you can't be a, a, a you know, a jeans or, or apparel manufacturer and not have some kind of presence presence in China because of the labor and because of how huge the market is. And the last sentence of the book was like, if Levi's can't do it, maybe nobody can. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good lesson for us all to, to, to kind of say the challenges of doing the air quote right thing and confronting market realities is not simple. And I'm not suggesting that any of these corporate leaders have a easy job but at the end of the day that's the job yeah yeah and we've got work to do and as is you've highlighted you know it's like are we going to put ourselves out of work as an esg department because it becomes so ingrained i agree like that no yeah. there's always a, a something that needs to be thought of around the corner and, and be progressing it i'll i'll tell one more yeah. quick story i think to your point like we want the businesses to address moral things, but if we get stuck, if they decide to take a position that's different than mine, um, I just, I'm gonna talk about a conspiracy theory, right? That uh, since last night was the Super Bowl, the whole Taylor Swift thing, and uh, people were fixing the Super Bowl so that Kansas City would make it far, so that Taylor Swift would have a platform to, you know, go support Biden or something like that. And this is conspiracy theory, and this is bad that someone has that much power. But I'm like. Uh, I hope she does that, actually. I hope that's what's happening and that this all plays out exactly like the conspir conspirators are suggesting, because that's my point of view. But then if she got up there and said something different, then I'm like, what's it? She can't be doing this. She, she has too much power. Why are we letting her just influence everyone like this? So you're getting a little. She's just a lady that came to support her man at the game, and everybody needs to get off her back. Okay. As it turns out, that's all that it that it was. But that's I was like, please was. grab the mic, Taylor, and say something outrageously in my favor. Yeah. The other thing well, I was thinking when you just told the Levi story. So back in that day, you had other you know forces to contend to contend with. Now you also have this whole cancel culture too. So it's almost like who's going to decide the right thing? It's not even you or your company anymore. There could be a group of consumers that just decide to cancel you, and it might not be aligned with your values. They're canceling you for something that aligns with their values, but that doesn't matter to the viability of your business if you know you get effectively canceled. So you have to fear like the general public now, where everyone has a platform and everyone can you know publicly say exactly what they think and have all these tens of thousands, millions of people listening to them. So that's a different environment as well. Poor Levi's experienced when back in the day when they tried to go to China. I think that's right. I I mean. 
And, and I keep saying we cannot exclude our way into inclusion. This is just the wrong way of driving inclusion through exclusion. Now, do I want, you know, white nationalists and transphobes to have a platform? No. But guess what? That's that's what this is. That's, the, you know, the yeah. the the scrum of democracy and open dialogue. And, um, you know, and, and and I do think over time, these things kind of look at Kanye, Conway, Kanye, like I'm not a fan and he's said some crazy stuff. And I think the market is, you know, rightfully castigating that. So I, I do think at the highest level, it works out. And he was in a Super Bowl ad yesterday. I couldn't believe it. I was totally floored and confused on how this yeah. person is back. Canceled being for a hot minute. Sponsored by someone, again, as a spokesperson. But, um, well, as important as these topics are and as exciting uh, or as much as I enjoy this conversation, especially the philosophical components and why do we exist or why do businesses, we got to uh, wrap it up here. We are going to play a game real quick, Jeff, before we go. Okay. Um, and your regular – podcaster by the way i love the name of your podcast making waves on purpose uh yes. that's something we always talk about here like sometimes mix it up you know do that yeah. so i like that um but okay so here's the game this game is called um things previously named other things okay um it's inspired by the idea of not dead naming that's the inspiration of this game but we're going to look back at uh at an old name so you tell me this what is the current name of the company that was once named Backrub, and I'll give you options. There was a company that used to be named Backrub. Was it Google, Oracle, OpenAI, or Lyft? <laughs> wow. Google. Google? Yeah. That's correct. Well done. Wow. Yeah. They named their company Backrub. Um, <laughs> something to do with backlinks their whole thing was about backlinks you know like seo yeah. and creating backlinks and stuff so they went back rub and at some point they're like yeah <laughs> let's change that um so uh but we all the point is we all respect their new name we don't go around calling them back rub so right good for us uh okay well thank you for playing uh that was the first time we ever played that particular game which is the game for 2024 and uh you were a winner thank you wow but you win nothing except the pride of, of the pride of being a, a winner. <laughs> I mean, the rest of the day, I'm going to think of myself as a winner. So I that's right. <laughs> All right, excellent. Well, Jeff, thank you for joining us. This has been another wonderful episode, if I don't say so myself, of the ESG Experience Podcast. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed your time with us, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast directory. There's a new episode every month. We appreciate our loyal subscribers for continuing to support our podcast. And if you want to continue the conversation between episodes, follow us on your favorite social media channel at hashtag ESG experience. Thanks again, Jeff. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Loved it.